Okay, we're coming in this like next plus or minus or like hour plus a little bit. Um, we have an exciting new part of the CSDMS meeting. Um, and this is a combination of the um, spring school that we just taught in the week before um, the CSDMS meeting. Um, we had 22 participants here and focused on, we're focused on cyber training skills, um, basic GitHub, basic Python, um, learning about these tools that um, CSDMS puts together and the community puts together. And one of the things that people then um, do as part of this course is team projects where they try to apply um, what they just learned and like take advantage of tools that are already there. All of them are earth scientists. They come with different backgrounds um, and different topical interests. And you'll see that through today, but we'll have like each team up on stage and like show us how far they got in their team projects. The idea is that these are um, contained pro projects. So we try to like beforehand define or like as a team, they defined an idea of like, this would be something that students could use as an, uh, uh, to introduce a concept or like a fairly like exploratory first step, but they are presented as notebooks or uh, teaching modules that later on people in the community can use. Um, we'll have five different groups. The first group consists of Alex, Marina, Bunti, and Jed. Um, and they all were interested in long-term landscape evolution or tectonic processes or more deep earth uh, processes, uh, river incision, etc. cetera. Um, they have a modular course set up. <laughs> so so um, they will like each walk you through like one of the like um, uh, sort of process modules that they have made available through a new notebook. So I'll hand it to Alex. Um, there is enough time for people to ask questions. So like, be aware, like we'll, we'll have time for questions and for like interactions. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Alex uh, Lip. I'm a final year PhD student at Imperial College. Uh, so just to introduce what, we, what we're sort of aiming for and what we've produced. So uh, we're basically aiming to produce like a teaching resource to allow students to sort of develop some intuition on la long-term landscape evolution. Closer? Okay. Uh, so the main thing we're interested in allowing students to understand were the impacts on the different sort of erosional parameters you might use. So er erodibility, diffusivity, uh, spatial patterns of uplift and how that impacts the long-term uh, steady state landscape, the impact of orographic rainfall, and then using the new litho layers package, um, the impact of differential rock strength, and then how some of those things might be uh, recorded in provenance records. So just to sort of give everyone a primer, we are we're sort of the model setup we're assuming is just a, a square grid of 100 by 100 kilometers. Uh, and all of the models assume a diffusivity according to just a standard diffusion equation and then an advective, uh, advective landscape evolution model. So just as like a primer. And then I'll hand over to Jed, who's going to talk about uh, erosional parameters. Yeah, so kind of as the first step, and this is also just as much for us to kind of get a grasp of the right range of uh, variable values to use in the model. Uh, we ran the same model with all the same parameters, except for changing uh, between a range of five different diffusivities and KSP. So for rock erodibility, just start looking at how the kind of base land lab model of, again, fast cape eroder and linear Diffusion results in different landscapes. So we can see here uh, those different combinations of erodibility and diffusivity and how that, and the main parameter then we extracted, we extracted a drainage density just for seeing, uh, again, building kind of an intuitive sense of how these change the overall form of the landscape. So we can see moving from uh, very uh, high erodibility and low diffusivity where we get much more dissected landscape, landscapes with high drainage density, and then moving into very high diffusivity uh, with lower erodibility, where we get more subdued landscapes and overall lower relief over the course of, and these were all run for the same uh, number of time steps in the model. And I think I will then turn it over to. Okay, so as Alex said, uplift rate is one of the factor control the evolution of the surface, right? 
and different assumptions we saw in different circuits, uh, landscape evolution. And in this model, I show some of the basic assumptions of uplift rate. When first we think about like the constant uplift rate, and then the second binary, when there are two um, uplift rate different at the top and at the bottom. And in the third case, when we use the linear functions, like uplift rate is related to like the linear function with the y-axis and the fourth one dome shape. When I add zoom, the parabolic functions between uplift rate and y-axis and the last one, the more fancy one, when we adopt the components in land lab called normal fault to control the, the uplift. And you can see that when we use different assumptions, the result is different topography and also different drainage area. And inside the models, a student can try to use different assumptions and understand like the, the results. And okay. So um, the next component was the orographic precipitation component. So here uh, we wanted to kind of explore how to incorporate different precipitation patterns into the land lab um, framework. So in order to do that, you need to add a water flux into the model that then will go into a discharge component taken by the uh, fast cape eroder um, algorithm. So um, we devised four scenarios. So the first one is just a binary one where the top half has a higher precipitation than the, the lower half of the grid. Then we did a linear component where it's just linear with respect to the y-axis values. Um, following on that, we have as the orographic, kind of more orographic um, scenarios. So the simple case here is just the precipitation scales with the, with the elevation values. They're normalized to fit, to fit into the, the range of uh, precipitation values that we would expect. Um, I took Boulder as the reference place because we're in Boulder. Um, <laughs> so um, then uh, the final one, which was the most complicated one, was the, um, uh, I, you know, I could have done, you know, solve all the physics equations for the orography that would have taken forever. So I didn't want to do that. So what can I do? Um, I was like, okay, well, I need to include some sort of, um, uh, proportionality with the elevation, then I, I took the maximum point of any north-south transect and decided that every point north of that maximum value would, would have a higher precipitation value than all the points south of the maximum point at each north-south um, transect. And then I assumed that the wind, that it would be a system created by a wind coming from the north, so it would the north were side would get more precipitation than the southern side. And it, it's based on assumptions, it's not a great model, but it kind of fits the, what we would expect, you know, the northern side having more precipitation and the scales with, with uh, elevation and then the southern side having less precipitation. So it's just kind of encouraging students as well to create their own modules and to show that it's easy enough to make new functions and to integrate those functions into the land lab um, kind of main framework. Uh, and just as like a, a final synthesis chapter, um, we, oh uh, yeah, uh, we also uh, use the little layers package to explore the impact of, if you sort of are uplifting uh, lithological layers with different strengths, the impact that might have on like the total sediment flux. And then by tracking what rocks are being eroded, you can also sort of generate sort of synthetic provenance record through time. Uh, so I'll just skip over that quickly and just sort of describe the, there's a final synthesis chapter where we're trying to put all this together to sort of mimic a real, a real landscape. So here we have both uh, like a domal uplift, stratigraphically layered rocks of different strength and orographic precipitation. And we explore how that evolved through time. So here we just have the, the rock strength broadly increasing with depth, but a little bit of randomness to simulate sort of natural variability. And then we just uplift like an anticline. And then just going through time, uh, we can see different rock types being exposed at the core and topography evolving. And because of the orographic effect, it's sort of asymmetrical. 
and then gradually we build a more complex landscape um, using different rock strength, variable rainfall, uh, yeah, all in land lab. So the idea is that by the end of the course, the student is able to build sort of quite complex things, having built it up module by module. So yeah, happy to take any questions. Very, very nice work. Uh, so just out of curiosity, are we these, these vertical things that we see stick out eh, in, in the south, uh, are they then the next step? Are they diffused away or what? Uh... So actually with it's we haven't quite worked out how to integrate the litholaires with diffusion because the you'd need to have basically like a particle tracking system where the, the litholaires package are perfectly like like grid based and you can't assume a lateral transport so actually this isn't technically this doesn't use diffusion in this particular model um but yeah I, in the real world they would sort of diffuse out and soften over time i guess they're like equivalent to the flat irons thanks They're on GitHub, so the URL here, if you want to use them. <laughs> they need a bit of polishing, but go ahead. <laughs> So uh, we're, we're sequences, the teams like totally choose their own topics, right? We sequence them a little bit in a source to sync uh, order. That was very arbitrary, but like that's how I propose to do it. So the next group um, focused on upland landscapes and was um, looking at like susceptibility for landslides. Um, and they're going to show their code that is um, for landslides and um, failures. So this was team landslide susceptibility. Anybody? Who is going to speak for them? <laughs> Scott, <laughs> you're the fires, fires and landslides. Or are you then still combining the fires and landslides? No. Okay. So this is Jill, um, Nick. Sebastian and Emily um, is over there. And David, yes. So hi, I'm Sebastian. Uh, we are very excited to uh, present 
Oh, sorry. I'm Sebastian. We are very excited to present our very small project. Uh, well, um, we all know that climate change has a great impact on the occurrence and intensity of uh, extreme events. So, for instance, fires and also extreme rainfall events and landslide. And so we were very curious to see uh, how the combined effect of fires, extreme fires and uh, extreme rainfall events and landslide uh, would result. Uh, so we made, uh, we explored this by combining uh, land lab components in this small uh, notebook. Hi everybody, I'm Nick. Um, I'm gonna scoot over here so I can control it. So, um, as Sebastian said, we were curious about how um, uh, wildfire, wildfires changing soil uh, co cohesiveness, cohesivity, um, and increasing erodibility uh, would impact the occurrence and size of landslides and uh, then as uh, sediment flux as well. So we used the, well, we used a stochastic fire generator um, created by an, uh, another uh, CSDMS team that we modified for our model here, um, and as well as the Highlands Bedrock Landslider component and the Space uh, Sediment Transportation component. So um, here we're just initializing some of our steps um, and creating the uh, burner function. Um, the way the uh, fire generator works is choosing a random grid cell from the DEM that we load uh, and a random fire uh, radius, um, and then any, any cell or uh, grid cell that falls within that radius has its uh, erodibility boosted by a set factor. And so, yeah, here we initialize our components um, and use the uh, BMI topography component to load a 30 meter DEM of the Oregon Coast Range, which we chose because it's a well-studied area, with a lot of parameters that we could find uh, and include in our model, uh, as opposed to just choosing something. So this is the DEM that we started with. Um, you can see there's a well-developed drainage area with some pretty steep slopes. Um, and here we set a bunch of the uh, parameters for our uh, model. So we're using a time step of one year and simulating 10 years of fires uh, with a high, uh, a high recurrence interval of the fires um, at about one year. Uh, our soil properties, um, we had an initial soil depth of half a meter uh, for the coastal range. Um, and then our boundary conditions allow for flow out of the sides of the models. Uh, that was a choice we made to simplify the modeling process. <laughs> so here is our uh, fire function running. As you can see, um, seven fires occur over the 10 year simulation. Uh, and it ran for about a, a minute and a half. So fairly quickly on this DEM uh, and here, is a plot of the fire locations and the erodibility change after each fire. So um, each fire is centered around or at one of the centers of the circles and then um, basically multiplies the erodibility of that cell um, or all of all the cells within the fire radius. Um, this is the sediment flux after the fires. Um, as you, uh, you can see, it mostly follows the a major drainage pattern up to the north, but there are a few going out to the sides here. Um, and then after this, we run the uh, bedrock landslider and space components to uh, sort of move some sediment around and see how that will affect our sediment flux. So in this image, we have uh, areas of deposition in green to blue and areas of uh, landslide occurrence in uh, the, the warmer colors. Um, and as you can see, uh, we've had quite a few different events move some soil around. And then again, we plot our sediment flux and it, it looks very similar to our first plot, but some of the channels are a little more defined. And if we were to review the, the, uh, the scale bar here, you can see that there's a lot more sediment uh, being mobilized after the landslides have occurred. So um, that's what we modeled. Uh, this model did not take into account um, recovery of vegetation. Uh, did not take into account recovery of vegetation due to, uh, uh, you know, uh, that would increase uh, soil cohesivity or uh, sort of a proxy for erodibility over time. Um, and we didn't have the model recreate 
uh, more soil um, because one, it's over a 10 year period, which uh, is not really a, a time scale for bedrock to be, become soil. Um, and I think that covered everything that we considered. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Um, for, the, for the fire function, you have a, a perfect circle kind of where the impact is, right? What you know is, uh, can the fire function take into account wind direction or kind of topographic boundaries that it can't? Sometimes fires are stopped by ridges or anything. Can you tell a little bit more about that? So I'm sure that could be incorporated, but our model was very simplistic in the location of the fire. Um, next year. Just stand next to you, Dano. Uh, just from my understanding, is it um, uh, so that the, the material that's deposited by the landslide that you give that a different erodibility, and that's why you you increase the, the sediment flux? Yes. Yeah, so the um, erodibility uh, is increased by the fire, um, and basically modifies the parameters that the bedrock landslider uses to move sediment. Um, so we didn't change the erodibility of landslided material, um, but increasing the erodibility increases the number of landslides. Okay, thanks. Landslide. So this component is made to simulate deep-seated landslides, um, but we found it more user-friendly and fit our needs better uh, for our shallow-seated landslides. So we used a soil depth of half a meter, um, and the tool can do deeper-seated landslides, but we didn't utilize it in that way. Just to follow up on Dano's question, is the mechanism that increases the flux farther downstream from the landslides, the fact that you put a lot of material in the upper parts of the, the creek profile and steepen it or? Yeah, so basically we've moved extra material into the stream channels, um, which you can see here. Um, the, yeah, the green depositional uh, areas are largely at the bottoms of the slopes, uh, which is increased soil thickness in the channels, which the space component moves to the uh, outlet. So it's, uh, it's not transport limited, but, but limited by how much stuff is there in the, the creek bed? I don't think we uh, took that into account. Thank you. In your fire model, do you have a propagation of the fire from the, the, the source of the, I mean, the initial ignition point? No, we just set a radius and have everything within the radius uh, increase in erodibility by a, a set factor. All right, thank you. It's, it's kind of interesting how like everybody's mind like straight away goes to like all these like more complex add-on like <laughs> functionality. Um, and right, like it was, I, I think I literally, when we set up the team project and told people, um, I told them like we, in the course itself, there's only like 10 hours or so that you're like literally doing team projects, but there was a weekend and people 
cram through a weekend a little bit more and I think. Um, so this group is also like more in upland environment and um, basically they started as like abrupt event was a really large group of people and um, riffed off of some of the same uh, processes but with a different application. And so it's, um, Hello, uh, my name is Archana. I'm a third year PhD student at Montclair State in New Jersey. And today our group is going to be talking about uh, using the uh, Land Lab Toolkit to simulate sediment flux after forest fires. Um, and so briefly, um, forest fire intensity is increasing with climate change, uh, especially in the Western United States. Fire season is lengthened due to warmer springs, uh, longer drier season and burn area, which then impacts the soil and vegetation, making it drier. Um, there is less fire, but the events that happen are larger and more catastrophic. And we also know that sediment flux increases after fire events. And so for our project, we wanted to ask this question and figure out how might climate change in Two different scenarios, a medium emission scenario and an extreme emission scenario. Um, how would that sort of general scenario affect sediment flux after forest fires? Hello everyone, I'm Scott Fian. I'm a 25th year PhD student at the University of Nevada. Uh, and so our, our kind of methods here are we're going to set up a GitHub repository as we've kind of looked at here. We're not going to go into the details, just we have it in a presentation format. Um, but that, all this stuff we kind of learned uh, in this past week and a half. Uh, as Archana said, we're going to have two precipitation scenarios, and we're really just simulating for 100 years to kind of see how these are going to affect sediment flux throughout our, our model domain or our, our landscape. Uh, and then we also developed the stochastic fire model. We didn't use the one that was currently in land lab because circles are hard and we like squares, as you'll see. Uh, and then we're going to use this stream power uh, with alluvium conservation, the space and entrainment, the space model. Sam absolutely crushed it on getting that uh, up and running. And so we're going to have uh, increasing scale, uh, increasing KS, and that's going to just scale with our fire. It's a binary switch; it's an on-off, as we'll look at. Um, and then we're going to, yeah, just use these output radiuses that uh, have some relationship with cohesion. And then we're going to run stochastic precipitation uh, across that fire or across our our model. And so uh, this is what our fire distributions are going to look like. And so on our y-axis here, this is just number of fires. It's just a, a distribution that we're sampling from. And then on our x-axis here, we just have uh, our, our fire size proportional to our grids so is just a, a length relative to what our model domain is. And so we've got these, these small, these, these, uh, uh, these moderate scenarios, and then we've got these large catastrophic wildfires. And so an important bit is this is what our fires are going to look like in model space, where in this, uh, this more frequent smaller fires, we only have five per our time step, and they're going to be small. And then for our, our uh, less frequent but large catastrophic wildfires, we're just going to have two, but as you can see, they kind of take up a huge, uh, huge area within our model. Um, and then, so we chose uh, two climate scenarios, and uh, as, as Marina put it, we chose Boulder because we're in Boulder, uh, and we've got this climate one and this climate two. Unfortunately, they're, they're, they're roughly the same, but um, we're going to still st sample from these stochastically uh, and just kind of look at primarily the effect of fire uh, over time. Hi everybody, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm a master's student at West Virginia University. Um, okay, so where did we run this model? You may ask. Um, the watershed is completely fake. Um, and what we did is we made a like kind of tilted with some random noise and then we ran a stream power model over that to give us um, a drainage network, uh, one kilometer by one kilometer that you can see in the right corner. And there's the hill shade of this watershed. Um, so then we put this in a raster model grid, uh, a land lab grid function. Sorry. Um, we added, so that's a bedrock elevation, and then we added soil depth to that. We just added two meters um, arbitrarily. So here's where we instantiated all of our land lab components. Um, we use linear diffusion uh, just for simplicity. And then, like Scott said before, space. And here's the time loop that we ran. Um, so you can see for each loop, we choose 
a random precipitation um, from our climate data. And then we also update the K values um, each time from the stochastic fire model. So here's what we found. Um, so this is the control. There's no fires in this. Um, so we can see that sediment flux kind of makes sense. It's where the drainage area um, accumulates uh, just to make sure it all works. Um, so here's one of the model runs with fire. So the red squares are fire. Um, and you can see, sorry, easy gift maker wasn't working this morning. So we're doing this, um, but you can see where it kind of increases um, sediment flux. And if you notice the color bar, um, it actually increases that quite significantly. So here's just another uh, fire run. Um, so yeah, the watershed with the most fire kind of has the most sediment flux, which is cool. And here's one of our larger fires. Um, I guess it's actually more than one larger fire. But yeah, notice the color bar again. Um, or just the maximum sediment flux is pretty significantly larger than the smaller fires. So what does this look like with precipitation? I guess, okay, this is it without precipitation. Um, so fire is on the bottom and you can see that sediment flux tracks pretty well with fire. And then when we add precipitation, we lose that effect a little bit because um, we see that precipitation is actually pretty important for the sediment flux. Um, and we kind of lose the effects of the fire, which was an interesting result. So here's the same thing with the larger fire. Um, so just notice the middle plot we have on the y-axis, the percent of watershed impacted by fire goes up to like 50% um, in a similar result. We didn't do any statistical analysis, but I think it's pretty clear that a lot of the um, precipitation trends are reflected in the sediment flux and the fire trends really aren't. Yeah, so clearly this was a, a simplified model. And so for, for our future work, we, we really do need, as someone asked earlier, we need more realistic fire habit. And yeah, so like I said, squares are nice, but incorporating elevation, vegetation, wind direction, all those kind of things we think would, uh, would, would work quite nicely. We also need to better constrain the relationship between our fire magnitude cohesion and then our changes in, in our KS or our rotability value. Like I said, it was just an on off switch, but it would be nice to kind of to, to trend that with our, our, our fire growth and, and actually scale it properly. And then we also want to apply this to a real location. We need a real DM, real fryer projections, and then a little more complex climate data. And then we also want to uh, compare it to actual measured sediment flux going forward. Uh, these are references. And we also just wanted to thank our instructors for this week. This was, this was really fun, as we can all attest. So maybe give them all a round of applause because it's been really great. Any questions? So when part of the grid experienced fire, by how much did you change the erodibility? Order of magnitude, no idea, that's right. Gotcha. <laughs> Um, so the, if I understand it well, the, the precipitation had an impact on the sediment load because it could transport it, right? But does the precipitation also have an impact on the fire? Will it, you know, slow down the fire or, or you know, stop the fire or not? No. So how we, how we did it was we just ran a couple, uh, ran a fire scenario, got an initialized landscape, and then gave it a precipitation and saw it after the fact. But that's a great point. So you said that you thought that the impact of the fires was not that great on the sediment load. Precipitation was the, the greater impact. Why do you think that is? Why are fires not having a bigger impact? Um, maybe because we only changed the K value by an order of magnitude. We didn't really play around with that that much.
if if only everyone had seen the like fire talks at the meeting before getting started on these projects, right? Um, I, I mean, one thing that I find interesting, I mean, some of the questions that you asked today are questions that could be added in like sort of a discussion topic for students to like ponder at the end of like doing these um, simplified experiments and say like, what do you really think that is like a, an additional complexity or what if we would and do a hypothetical on that? Like each of these are in the end like presented for like students to be used or learners to be used or like as an example for a set of like simple notebooks to build upon. So um, we have a whole bunch of people who are interested in coastal behavior and um, they took not out of the land lab um, component set, but they worked with a model that's called Pi Delta RCM. And the two developers or the two active developers that are um, working on that model are here too. So like they will get like a surprise and like may have some feedback <laughs> um, or can be super proud because their model was accessible enough and easy enough and documented enough that other people could start like tinkering with it, right? So. Um, this is the group that worked on vegetation effects on uh, coastal systems. Elena, Isamar, Liz, Kelly, and Lexi are presenting. Um, hi, yes, my name is Liz, and uh, Lexi and I will be doing the presentation, and Ismar and Kelly will be fielding your questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so today our talk is titled Exploring the Interaction of Salt Marsh and Mangrove Vegetation on River Delta Evolution. So we know that vegetation influences delta morphology and evolution. With, so our research question is, does a delta that grows with mangrove vegetation evolve differently than a delta that grows with salt marsh, salt marsh vegetation? This is motivated because uh, vegetation ecotones eco are shifting due to climate change. So it's likely that coastal areas currently occupied by salt marshes may transition to mangroves. Uh, an example of this would be South Florida. So in this image, you can see that currently mangroves um, dominate Southern Florida, but we think that possibly they will start shifting north where salt, salt marshes are in the north. To address this question, we use the Delta RCM vegetation model. Um, so the vegetation model was built firstly on the Delta RCM model. So the Delta RCM model is a Delta, a river Delta formation and evolution model with channel dynamics. The vegetation uh, component was expanded to include vegetation effects. So in this model that was published in 2018, vegetation colonizes, grows, and dies. Um, it increases a bank stability and improves resistance to flow. And the original parameters for vegetation, such as stem diameter, carrying capacity, logistic growth rate, and rooting depth represent marsh gra grass type plants. So what changes did we make to this model? Uh, we made some changes to the source code. code. Um, so the parameters are now defined by a YAML file. We converted um, X range to range because the original model was um, written in Python 2 and we wanted it to run in Python 3. And we use mangrove parameters for comparison to salt marshes. So in this table, you can see that we changed some of the parameters from salt marsh like stem diameter from 0 0.006 meters to 0 0.14. And the carrying capacity is um, much different between salt marshes and mangroves, as well as the rooting depth. I'm gonna pass it over to Lexi. Yep, so I will be talking about our Jupyter Notebook and how we kind of set it up. So at the very beginning, uh, we didn't have PyYAML installed, so we had to install it. And then our next statement just imports uh, YAML, which we use to import the YAML file, and image.io, which we use to create the GIF. Sam, maybe that would have been really helpful for you. <laughs> um, and we import the Delta RCM class from the Python file. And then the next line of code, we actually import the YAML file and what that looks like, at least our YAML file um, has all these parameters in it, uh, which 
these were originally defined within the Python file itself. So we just made that easier for users to change their own values. And uh, we decreased things like the water particles and sediment particles just to make it run faster. Um, and our total time step is 5,000, which represents about 150 years. And so then our second to last block is just uh, setting up the model. So instantiating the model with our parameters and changing our values for either salt marsh or mangrove, like what Liz was saying from our table, and then running the model, uh, which takes a very long time. And then our last block of code just creates the GIF files, GIF. <laughs> and so here's one example of out, like just one of our simulations, which was a mangrove simulation. And the top left graph shows the elevation. So the white is zero elevation. And then the darker it is, the more negative it is. Our top right graph shows the vegetation, which is from zero to one based on a density, a vegetation density. The bottom left is discharge and the bottom right is water surface elevation. And so we, we decided to save time steps at approximately 25 year intervals. So that's what you're seeing here is the evolution of 25 year intervals over 150 years for a mangrove um, run. And so kind of to transition, this is what the four different scenarios we use kind of based on the original paper parameters. And this is specifically for salt marshes. So the way this works is that from top to bottom, we have a decreasing flood frequency. So what that means is the 75 is 75 time steps in between a flood. So 100 time steps between a flood is less frequent than 75 time steps between the flood. And then on the X axis, we have the sand percentage. So 25 is 25% 25 sand, 75% mud. And the right is 75% mud, 25% sand. And really just what we wanna notice is that the flood frequency didn't really seem to impact the vegetation or uh, growth that much. They're pretty similar. And then the, like in the marshes, we have a lot of small channels forming off the main channel. Whereas when we go to our mangroves, you can see there's a lot less kind of like white space in the vegetation. So we saw that there were a lot less channels forming. But these are again, the uh, the same 25%, 75% sand and flood frequency. And we also noticed that when we did the mangrove vegetation for 25% sand, we had a lot less colonization around the entire semicircle. And then we're gonna do further analysis using the top left scenario. So that is the 25% sand and 100 day flood which Liz will talk about next. <clears throat> so yeah, we compared those top two left plots, which um, were the base conditions in the original model. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, so I hope you got that. Um, <laughs> so if we compare the results between the salt marsh and the mangrove deltas, um, between the vegetation and the mean free surface elevation, we can see that there are differences. So in the first plot on the left, we have time in years on the x-axis and vegetation cover uh, in pixels on the y. And the salt marsh and mangrove vegetation start out a little bit different, um, but they do converge around the 60-year mark and then slightly diverge again at the 150. Um, in comparison, the on the plot on the right, we have, again, time in years on the x-axis and mean free surface elevation in meters on the y. And again, the salt marsh and mangrove uh, vegetation deltas um, start differently, but instead of converging, the differences only grow. Um, 
And so if we can tie this back into our research question, does a delta that grows with mangrove vegetation evolve differently than a delta that grows with salt marsh vegetation? Um, we found that yes. We found spatial and temporal differences between vegetation cover, free surface elevation, and as well as the other variables. Uh, so to conclude our key findings and implications, uh, first that we were able to simulate delta growth under different dominant vegetation conditions using the Delta RCM vegetation model. Uh, secondly, we found spatial and temporal differences in Delta evolution between the vegetation types. And this is gonna be important because the evolution of coastal areas under different types of vegetation is important for planning and management of coastal areas, as well as uh, thinking about all those ecosystem services that mangroves and salt marshes provide. So with that, um, they will be happy to take your questions. <laughs> um, great job. Uh, my question is, thinking about your plot that showed the differences in elevation between um, salt marshes and the mangrove simulations, has that been observed like in the real world, do we know? <laughs> Hi, um, <laughs> that's a really good question. So it really, oh, how do I explain this? So I guess I'll also answer it a little bit with the lateral accretion because mangroves do accrete laterally. And so you do see those increases. They're known as land builders, right? So they both go in X and the Y direction. <laughs> is the way that I like to explain it to people. So you do see those differences. I'm not so sure off the top of my head in terms of salt marshes, um, but I do know based on, you're comparing trees and the tree root systems. I wish we had a picture of a red mangrove because I can explain it a lot better. But you can, you can think of red mangrove root systems as kind of like spider claws is what I tell people and, or spider legs. And so they're able to trap sediment, but also the organics come into play and they're able to, when their leaves fall and kind of degrade within their mud systems, they're able to trap those leaves and it doesn't really leave the system. So they kind of do accrete up as well. So you do see that sort of, but I'm not too sure. Where. Yeah, I can expand on that um, as well. So this free surface elevation, the differences there are really related to the vegetation properties itself. So like if you think of a salt marsh, the, it's like really high density and there's like lots of plants everywhere, whereas the mangroves are trees. So they're like a little bit more spread out. So what that graph is showing is not like, um, it's, it's really related to like how the water is like interacting with the vegetation itself. So more of like a hydrodynamic impact, but this model has, yeah, like uh, Ismar was saying, has no vertical accretion for either the salt marsh or the mangrove, which would be really important to include in a model of Delta growth because uh, typically in like a salt marsh, that organic sediment that Ismar was explaining makes up like between like 30 to 80% of the material that's actually on the platform, um, depending on the mineral sediment load to those areas. So uh, yeah, it's a bit more complex than the, this graph shows, I would say. Super cool. That's fascinating work. I think you guys should write a paper. <laughs> but I'm really wondering about uh, how the, the water surface elevation is higher in the, the mangrove cases. You were alluding to the hydrodynamic properties, but I would have guessed since they're so much more rarefied that they'd be less uh, resistance to the flow. And so maybe the, the flow would be less effectively channelized when it looks like it's more. I'm wondering if the, the deeper roots and the fact that it makes it harder to kill those, and so they're more at, on a longer time scale, more morphodynamically confining the flow more than hydrodynamically. What do you guys think? Yeah, I would I would agree with you. Um, do you have a, I, yeah, I have. Um, I can talk about this all day. So, <laughs> so in the Caribbean specifically, just off the top of my head, we have four different species of mangroves, right? Um, but the main two that a lot of people focus are on are red and black mangroves that have completely different types of root systems, right? And so that's not really simulated in the Pi Delta RCM veg model. But 
depending on the root system that you have, the colonization in terms of which type of mangrove you have, you're going to get different types of channelization and also the hydrodynamics of the system. So depending on how much salinity, for example, or soil stressors you have, there's going to be different kinds of mangroves in different parts of the deltaic region, right? And so those root systems really do affect the channelization. For example, as I explained with the spider leg analogy, black mangroves have prop roots, which I explain as like forks, sort of. And so they trap sediment, sand sediment um, completely differently than red mangroves would. So the channelization is different depending on the species as well. I just want to make you run. Um, awesome talk. Uh, I have a question about, so at the beginning you talked about how in some areas, you know, mangroves are, might be overtaking where salt marshes used to be. And so you ran these as separate, separate model runs. And so I was wondering if you had any comments about how, you know, if you use a mix of properties, how the delta changes, or if you start with like, you run the mangrove simulations, but start with the marsh, salt marsh um, elevation and bathymetry, how, if you thought about that at all. Yeah, that was a, actually like our initial uh, goal was to have the mangroves like encroach on the salt marsh in the model itself, uh, but we just ran out of time. But yeah, I think that would be really interesting. Um, given this is given the time, this was an awesome project. Our last team um, also focused on uh, deltaic processes. Um, and it shows you one of the um, merging conflicts in our community <laughs> where um, they use a different version of Pi Delta RCM, the more updated version um, that did not have yet vegetation characteristics. So like, <laughs> you gotta do something. Um, <laughs> this team... Um, <laughs> Included TN, <laughs> um, Jana, Lawrence, Katie, and Juliana are going to talk about Delta RCM and Delta processes. So we're just going to introduce ourselves real quick. My name is Caitlin or Katie Turner, and I'm at Louisiana State University, and I'm a PhD student. I'm Julianne Davis. I'm at UNC Chapel Hill and also a PhD student. Hi, I'm Lawrence Willis. I'm a PhD student at UC Irvine and also a PhD student. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenna Labdaladif. I'm a master's student at UT Austin. And uh, Tian Dong, who's a uh, postdoc at UT Austin, who had to leave early and not here with us today, contributed quite a bit to uh, this project. And then we would also like to thank Ethan, Josie, and Mark for all of their help for getting helping us and Arena for helping us get this model to run. So one of the main things we really wanted to do was connect real life situations that are happening to our Jupyter notebook. So we used Wax Lake Delta as kind of a case study using the Pi Delta RCM model. So one of the things that coastal Louisiana is really experiencing right now is land loss. And that is due to a range of factors such as subsidence, sea level rise, and as well as this lack of sediment that is happening partially can be due to the upstream damming that's been occurring in the Mississippi watershed. And so we actually experience in the Wax Lake Delta Mississippi area, 50% less sediment rates than their his early historic values. So this is definitely due to dam trapping, trapping, trapping sediment. And the other part that's going on is when we have the Atchafalaya River having this kind of pipeline of levees, we're not getting sediment going into the surrounding areas, which is why if you've ever looked at the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan, there are a lot of diversions coming in. And so this was kind of our, our inspiration for this project. And so you can actually see with Wax Lake Delta, it was created, it was a man-made flood diversion. And so you can see the growth of this Delta over time. 
And so we wanted to see how, if we change sediment, how is this going to impact delta, delta growth? And so the first part of this was to characterize stream flow. So we wanted learners to understand what, what is happening upstream. So our first part is looking at um, using a Python package uh, called data retrieval, which takes USGS stream flow data and showing them different ways to calculate the flow frequency curve, as well as the exceedance probability and the intermittency factor, because the intermittency factor really tells us how long we're going to have um, floodwaters that will contribute to growth. So it walks learners through what all of these processes are and what they mean, as well as how to plot them. And so we can see a few of the plots that they'll be able to replicate themselves. And yeah. Cool. Yeah. So then there's some educational questions and comments here. Like, can you comment like what the intermittency factor might mean, et cetera. Um, and then we wanted the students to use uh, a morphodynamic model to basically simulate delta growth. Um, and in this context, uh, Pi Delta RCM, which is a reduced complexity model for delta growth, was a pretty ideal candidate because it can run within the Jupyter Notebook and basically build a delta in a couple of hours. Um, so actually, the developers are here. Um, and it's available through LandLab. So we basically set it up in this notebook and then um, designed a couple of experiments um, that the students would be able to play with basically different set of characteristics corresponding to different real world damming scenarios. And Julianne's going to walk through that. Broadly, we wanted to simulate different effects that dams can have. Um, dams can take a range of forms, but here we're kind of just reducing the complexity of the problem to think about an earthen dam, like you see on the right, that doesn't allow any water or sediment through. And then a dam that has a sluice gate allowing some water, suspended sediment, and bed load to continue moving downstream, like you see in the image on the left. The table below shows the scenarios that we have run. As Katie said, it's inspired by the Wax Lake Delta, but we're not claiming to be reproducing that system. <laughs> so we are looking at two different sediment concentrations, which you see in the rows. Um, originally a sediment supply of 0.3 and then 0.15. And then in the columns, we're changing the amount of sand versus mud. So changing the sand fraction to see what would happen if bed load is reduced. And as you move to the right in this table, the delta is totally made out of finer grain sediments and mud with no sand present. We call those baseline and then A through E. We'll be using that notation again. So just as a logistical thing. These models do take a bit of time to run as the other vegetation group said, which is why we have do not run this step in our <laughs> educational module. We recommend this as a lab with a homework component where these students run the models overnight um, and you know, do the hydrograph things on day one, day two, look at their output. But if you don't have that much time, we have also uploaded the results of our modeling that students can look at. So we then ask them to follow through some of these steps, import the data, and begin doing some different visualizations. This figure shows our outputs, and the format is the same. So the top left is our baseline. The top row has a, the initial sediment concentration. Bottom row sediment has been cut in half. And as you move left to right, the amount of sand decreases until you only have mud all the way on the right. This shows delta elevation and values in light green to yellow are elevations above the water surface. We ask the students to make different observations about what they see in these deltas. One that we have encouraged them to look at is the um, frequency of different elevations that they observe, like which deltas are more effective at building upwards versus outwards. And that's what these histograms are showing. We then ask them to look at bifurcations and the number of channels. So again, here we are showing those six simulations and the colors here are flow velocity 
higher velocities in yellows. And we ask the learners to compare these different deltas, think about how the changes in sediment could result in the changes in delta morphology that they see, and then make comparisons over time. These show the deltas at the end of the model runs. And then here, we look quite a few time steps earlier, but smaller deltas, and ask the students to kind of think about how these deltas grow and change through time and how that varies with sediment characteristics. We also invite the learners to make some predictions about other parameters they could change in this model. How could they simulate subsidence or sea level rise? Um, and so we link them to the documentation and encourage exploration of other ways that they could change the deltas that they can make in Pi Delta RCM. And I'll pass it back to Katie to wrap it up. No, we're good. Um, so part of this learning component is to link it to like the broader impacts as well. And we finalize it with just like a general discussion section where um, they can look at the broader impact of the entire watershed. So here's just an image of the Louisiana uh, or Mississippi River watershed area. And we're showcasing the um, cascading effects of dams along the watershed where resources are extracted all throughout. Um, and then we also uh, provide a link to the uh, uh, master plan for the Louisiana coast where they can um, look at restoration projects that are currently active and the different scenarios that they can use such models to kind of forecast for. Uh, the master plan also includes like uh, re reduction in budgets and mitigation efforts as well. So we wanna like invoke them to see other uh, broader impacts that uh, link science to society as well. And that's pretty much our, our model. Any questions? Hi, thanks so much for your work and building this really cool educational module. And of course, you know, being up in Minnesota, I appreciate doing it on the Mississippi. And I was just wondering if you guys have any insights into um, how much the locks and dams in the upper Mississippi actually affect the sediment supply to the lower river, considering the sharp drop in gradient to the lower Mississippi and the large amount of sediment buffered in the valley itself. Yeah, so it's actually a reduction of about 50% of historical values, which if you're thinking about land building, that's, that's a lot. And so it's starting to cause, um, we have other issues down in Louisiana. I go to LSU, so I get to study it a lot. And so subsidence is also part of our issue in sea level rise, but it used to be that the sediment could actually help counteract that. But because we don't have those same sediment, it's actually getting more difficult. So even when those diversions go in, it is gonna be kind of a diversion game of, okay, we can open this one, but we can't leave it open too long because it'll create shoaling on this channel. So it's still, it's the diversion network that they're creating down there is incredible. And so it's really kind of stemming from this issue that there is a lot less sediment. If you had another day or two, where would this go? Um, so I personally think it would be cool to see how the stratigraphy changes. So if there's a way to like incorporate uh, more uh, grain size variations, see how the stratigraphy would look like in a vertical sense while the delta is building up. So sometimes we see the delta is prograding versus aggrading. And uh, I think it would be cool to explore that uh, aspect. As other groups have said, we also had you know, an original idea and then what was feasible in the time given. So something we talked about originally would be running a delta for a certain amount of time and then starting to modify the characteristics instead of starting with an empty basin. 
but we think that would require modifying the source code and that was a bit beyond what we felt we could get done and present. So I think that's another direction we'd like to take this. I have a question. Oh, did you want to did you want to add more? Okay. Uh, what do you envision as the age level for the learners? So we were actually given an approximate age level, which is helpful. Um, and it was more advanced undergraduates and early graduate students. So when I was thinking about this, it really seems like a hydrology class or a geomorphology class because it really links those two together. And a lot of the times, if you take a class in, say, civil engineering and then one in geomorphology, you can kind of miss those links. So it was really for us to link it together. I just want to thank everybody for such hard work that was done to like get to these projects. Um, these participants. <laughs> know that you will be nagged by like the people from the integration facility a bit to like get this um, into the educational repository and there's like 100 other people that now know that these exist right <laughs> um and that may want to use it in classes or they may want to use um the material like for their own like hydrology class geomorphology class etc um i think these are wonderful i think some of you like really showcased um like sort of the progression of how a, a student or a learner or like someone who pulled this from a um, repository would interact with this and have questions and things and others focused a little others focused a little bit about the contributions that you you did make changes to code or like uh, small improvements to like how users would, would interact and i just appreciate like how many in um, ingenious, creative, like solutions you found for all these like obstacles that were there in the um, in the process of putting a notebook together like this. Um, 